Well, hi and welcome. My name is Casey Boland, and I'm a wealth advisor with HCM Wealth Advisors. And I'm joined today by Doug Johnson, who's our senior investment strategist, and Dan Rank, who's a research analyst with HCM Wealth Advisors. Welcome. So if you'd like to ask a question, please go to the bottom of your screen and click Q&A. And there you'll have an opportunity to submit your question. And we'll do our best to answer at the end of the webinar. So guys, it's it's been an interesting year. And so what do the Cincinnati Reds and the Dow Jones have in common? Winning streaks. You know, both seem to be asleep for quite some time and only to come alive with a long streak here. So the Reds just had a 12-game winning streak recently, the longest since 1957. And the Dow just completed, unfortunately, I'm saying completed at the end of today, a 13-day streak of positive returns, longest since I was a senior in high school back in 1987. And, you know, coming into the year, that was not on the radar, I think, for the Reds. Uh, and, and I think we're hopeful for the Reds, hopeful for the Dow, but certainly I don't think it was on the radar. All right, so let's look at what the picture was coming into the year. So coming into the year, we had persistently high inflation. You had continued global monetary policy tightening. So we just saw that again yesterday. The Federal Reserve just increased interest rates again, uh, just to a level not seen in 22 years. And we had the Russia-Ukraine war, debt ceiling issues. Hey, we can cross one off the list. Is the, is the debt ceiling done? Are we, are we done talking about that? <laughs> You know, it's going to rear its ugly head again, unfortunately, at some point in time. I don't know how long that's in place, but uh, if I don't hear the word debt ceiling for a long time, I'm, I'm okay with that. Um, but, in, you know, in addition to that, it's weakening leading economic indicators. It's declining corporate earnings. It's inverted yield curve. I mean, if you're playing recession bingo and every one of these items is listed on your card, I, I'm not sure how you're not screaming bingo we have a recession and surprisingly no recession the stock market is off to a strong start and but you know many of these issues are still in play today so how did the market seem to debuck this data well i think it has to do with expectations the issues are still there but if expectations improve and that's what we've had then that's sometimes enough to move stocks higher so let's take a look at a few stocks uh, slides now that are going to be relating to stocks. So uh, interesting slide here. So what's been leading the way this year? Growth stocks. Hello, Barbie. Uh, the Barbie movie was like growth stocks surging 155 million in domestic box sales this past weekend. Oppenheimer, you know, kind of perceived as a steady, sure bet, kind of like value stocks lagged in ticket sales to Barbie. And, you know, growth tech stocks race out to a strong start. And we're going to see that as we kind of move on here uh, to the next slide. So, you know, the S&P uh, has, has performed well so far this year, but it's been interesting. It's been a narrow number of companies that were invited to the party as evidenced by this chart. And this chart shows the performance of the S&P 500 versus the S&P 500 equal weighted index from New Year's until Memorial Day. So looking at five months of the year. So, Quick explanation of this two securities on the chart, the S&P 500, uh, hence the name, it's made up of approximately 500 stocks. It's market cap weighted, which means that the larger the company, the higher the percentage of dollars is invested in the company. So let's give you an example. If you invested $100 in the S&P 500, the biggest company in the land is Apple. So $7.50 is invested in Apple while maybe 12 cents would be invested in a company like Cintas. So it seems a little strange, 60 times or plus more money in Apple versus a Cintas, but that's what you're dealing with. Uh, the equal weight in the index, hence its name, invests equally among the company. So with that same $100, you divide it by 500, which means that 20 cents is invested equally in all the companies. And the equal weighted index, why we're showing this and sharing this is, is it provides a better picture of how the average stock in the stock market is performing. And you can see in this chart, the stark contrast in returns through the first five months of the year. So that purple line is the S&P 500. It's up almost 9.3%. 
the equal weighted S&P, which is the orange, that bottom line, down 1.16%. So they were tracking together. You can see until like early March, which is right when the Silicon Bank failure occurred and you had the chaos with regional banks, which lasted a few weeks. But, but after that point, most of the market trended down while a narrow part of the market led by growth tech names really lifted the market up. And, and this disparity has historically not been good from the long-term sustainability of a move up in the market. So if, if we look at the next slide and in this narrow aspect of it, is this is going to give you a really good picture when we're talking about narrow and how narrow it is, because what we're talking about, what's called uh, market breadth uh, with a D, and it, it really measures what percentage of stocks within the S&P 500 are outperforming the index. And you can see the number here is 28% as of the end of June, and that was the lowest reading in 29 years. Uh, that's just how extreme it's been. You know, I don't know, again, how history plays itself out, but it's interesting if you see the last time you had a tech-led rally and then what followed. So we're looking at this chart. We look at 98, 99. Those were years where the market moved up. It was very narrow. It was led by growth in tech. The year, next year, we saw this trend change as many companies outperformed the market. And it was value stocks, actually, surprisingly, that did well outperforming versus growth companies. So... It's just an observation, not a prediction of things to come. But as I mentioned, a narrow move is not healthy for the stock market. So let's see how this is played out. We go to the next slide. So I, it, w the market may have been late to the party in many ways, but at least with the Memorial Day time period, and there was a party and finally everybody got invited. And here's what happened. The market move broadened. You can see it here. More companies began to participate. In both lines are moving together with the equal weighted S&P 500 actually outperforming the S&P 500. And, and the trend in recent years has been that, you know, the S&P 500 for a lot of people, it's where the action is at. It's one of the best indices to invest in. So why not just buy the S&P 500 and call it a day? Uh, well, here's why. And it, it hasn't happened in a while. But it does happen over the course of investing as we look at this chart called the lost decade. And, you know, this is why diversification matters. Um, for the 10-year period of 2000 to 2009, the S&P 500, which is in the far left there, it was negative. It severely underperformed many sectors of the market, including bonds. And, I mean, if you want the highest potential stock returns, it really boils down to you better pick the right asset class. And with diversification, you have a high likelihood of at least having some money in the best performing asset classes. But more importantly, in diversification, it, it gives your family the best chance to have financial security throughout your retirement years. And that's the real goal of what we're striving for. All right, moving on to the valuations here. Um, this is a chart that I really like the left-hand side. We're going to ignore the right two pieces and we're talking about P.E. ratios or price relative to earnings. It's a ratio. And the P.E. is a good metric to determine if a stock has strong performance potential. It's undervalued or maybe overvalued. And, and that's a high number may offer a lower return potential. So remember earlier, we were looking at the S&P 500. It's a cap weighted index. The top 10 stocks represent about a third of the stock market index but it has a PE you can see on that chart of a little bit over 29. And the remaining 490 stocks have a PE of right around 17.8. So the top 10 names, they're a bit overvalued. The good news is right now is there's, there's a number of stocks that have reasonable stock valuations. They're not screaming buys being undervalued, but they're not grossly overvalued. So you have to be cautious though when, when you look at PEs, they rarely correlate to how stocks perform maybe in the next year period. But PE ratios uh, do a pretty good job, and they're very correlated when you're looking at the prediction of how stocks will perform over much longer periods of time. So one more slide here from the market standpoint, and that's earnings. You know, coming into the year, the stock market was focused on inflation, what the Fed was doing, and what was going to happen with corporate earnings. And when you look at earnings growth, 
It's been negative now for two quarters and is expected to be negative again for this upcoming quarter. And you can see this on this chart uh, on the bottom right hand side. You're going to see where earnings growth, it's been a figure that it's showing with actual earnings. And the prior two quarters, it was negative. This quarter, the estimate again is it's expected to be negative. I mean, it actually, when you go back and it's hard to see, but earnings growth has slowed since Q2 2021. So, uh, you know, how's the stock market going up on negative earnings growth expectations? You know, we mentioned the word expectations earlier, and, and, and that's really what it is. It's expectations have improved. Earlier, we outlined all the ugly components coming into the year with that uh, bingo reference I had. And while the list of concerns is still similar, many have improved much more than what was expected which means that the likelihood of a recession has decreased dramatically. So if the odds of a recession have decreased, the hope by the stock market is that we're getting closer to the end of the cycle of deteriorating earnings growth, and earnings growth will likely start, or we hope, it'll start to accelerate in the coming quarters. So it's really about expectations, guys, and um, been a surprise in what's happened. Uh, I, it, it, on the, uh, Doug, I'll be surprised to hear what you're going to express here on you know, the, the picture of the economy, because certainly there's still a lot of concern out there. Yeah, no, I think there is. And, and now that we've got the debt ceiling out of the way, obviously, uh, we can start to, to you know, focus back on kind of the real issues that we've got here. So one of those that has been front and center um, now for the past, I'd say, 18 months is inflation. And the good news is inflation continues to uh, decline. Um both on uh, mainly over a year over year basis here. And that's what this chart shows. We can see the peak um, annualized at 9.1 um, back in, uh, we'll call this June of last year. And I think subsequently you can see that the, you know, the, the current bottom of the market um, was right around this level as well. So historically this has matched up pretty well that when you see the peak of a, of a high inflation cycle, um, that usually represents a bottoming uh, in the market. But what's interesting is you can see the components here, um, and some of these have stayed pretty steady. Um, we've seen a, a, a decent uh, increase uh, in the shelter number. Um, you've seen restaurants, hotels, and transportation stay the same. Um, but the big flip you've seen is in the energy space. So when inflation was at its peak, energy prices were contributing uh, quite a bit uh, to that number. Now you're seeing that almost as a detractor. Um, and that's even with oil prices, as I look at them um, this afternoon, hovering around $80 uh, a barrel, which I think most people would consider uh, to, to still be an elevated level. So the good news is that inflation is continuing to work its way down. The bad news is it's still probably not low enough to where the Fed can, what I would say, claim victory, so to speak. Um what that increase in both inflation and interest rates has done, though, it's given investors income opportunities uh, in the fixed income area. So um, you look at this chart here uh, showing a wide variety of not only yields, um, but also on the right side, uh, the impact of what a 1% rise or fall in interest rates um, would look like. So as we, as we quickly go down the yields here, two, five, 10 year treasuries, all hovering around 4%. Then you come down to things like the US ag, which I always refer to as kind of the S&P 500 uh, for bonds, um, you know, 4.8. Um, uh, investment grade corporates, five and a half. Things like high yield, eight and a half. Leveraged loans, floating rate close to 11. So you're, you're really seeing some good income opportunities. And then when you look at the, we'll call it the risk return profile of a lot of these different positions, they're, they're really shifted in, in favor um, of the return as opposed to the risk. Now, if we would have looked at this 18 months ago, it probably looks a lot different. Um, but take something like you know, the, the five-year treasury right now. A 1% fall in interest rates would result in an 8.6% return. And that's going to be over a full year um, because that part of that is going to be the interest component that's going to have to be paid out. Uh, over the course of the year. Now, go the other direction. Let's say that 
that um, that you see a one percent increase um, absolute on a five year treasury, the loss there is negligible. Um, so you're really starting to see some very good risk return metrics for some of these fixed income areas. Um, excuse me, and Dan will will get into that a little bit more. But uh, we think for the for the folks who have the you know, the, the 60, 40 or the 50, 50, or even 30% of their money in bonds. Um, you know, there's, there's really an opportunity now to earn return from that side of your portfolio where before uh, a lot of people felt the need to maybe use equities to risk up their portfolio because they didn't feel like they could get any return uh, from fixed income. Now, Casey mentioned recession before. Um, and what's funny is you, you Google search recession, recession indicators, you know, any combination of those words. And these are the first three headlines that pop up. So the, the very first one is Reuters. They're basically saying leading in, leading indicators point to a recession starting soon. Okay, so that, um, Casey, you, you mentioned a bullet point earlier. Your leading economic indicators are starting to point down. That makes sense. It sounds like the recession is right on our doorstep. Then you go to the conference board and they've got a little different take. So the probability of U.S. recession remains elevated. Okay, so not not near term, not going to happen. It just remains higher than normal. And then finally, you go to the third headline. So from CNN, the case for a 2023 U.S. recession is crumbling. Um, so no recession. So here in the first three headlines of a simple Google search, you've got three very different perspectives on whether or not we are going to have a recession at all. And if we do, when exactly is that going to take place. So before we kind of get into those, um, real quick, the Fed uh, yesterday went ahead and confirmed the fact that they're still not happy with where the level of inflation is. Uh, and they went ahead and raised um, interest rates by 25 basis points. In this case, you mentioned now they're, they are the, at their highest level uh, since 2001. So it's been a really, really long time uh, since we've seen the Fed funds rate um, where it is right now, right about five and a quarter to five and a half, um, depending where you look. Now, what's interesting about this chart, we all know that there has been a very, very steep increase. But if you look at the expectations going forward, they don't go up anymore. They actually come down. So there's a lot of forecasts and market participants still predicting that these rates are going to come down sooner rather than later. Um, I think the long run average here is about two and a half. And then the longest projection you've got here goes out to about 2025. But that tells us one of two things. It either says that the Fed's going to have to cut rates because there is a recession coming and that's how they historically combat that. Or they're going to cut rates because they feel like inflation has decreased sufficiently and they don't need to be restrictive anymore. And I think the path between those two scenarios is extremely wide. Um, I think that's important to understand. You're getting these projections, and I think you can you can get two very different outcomes uh, depending on why this might happen. And, and who's to say this has to happen exactly like this? Um, but we still have this, this, this very wide divergence, and I think what people uh, are expecting going forward. So back to the recession indicator. So there's hundreds of different indicators that you could look at uh, that could help determine whether or not we're in a recession, whether or not a recession is coming. Um, but we narrowed it down to about five that I think do a really, really good job of telling us whether or not we've got a recession um, that I would say, you know, maybe not tomorrow, but um, could be coming in the next quarter or two. So First, let's look at the you know the those indicators that are saying no recession. So we've got housing. So prices are remaining strong across the housing market. A lot of people expected mortgage rates going up to seven percent. It's going to cause you know big problems uh, for the housing market, but that just hasn't happened yet. Um, could be that there's just not a lot of supply in the market because a lot of people are sitting on three percent mortgages, and to take on a seven percent mortgage, you really need to get the price you want for your house. Um, and on the flip side, there may even not be a lot of you know, buyers out there um, because of those financing costs uh, being so high. So th there may be a little bit of a stalemate in the market right now, um, but for, for whatever reason, housing remains strong. 
um, then you go to corporate profit. So earnings remain resilient. Um, Casey just showed that even with negative earnings growth, um, you know, the expectation for, for some of these folks that, you know, had recession is imminent, uh, you know, we're expecting 10, 15, 20, 25% drops uh, in earnings growth. And we just haven't seen that yet. So while I'd say, you know, strong is probably not the right word, I'd say resilient um, certainly comes to mind. Uh, and we're, we're certainly not in a zone yet where we could say corporate profits are showing uh, recessionary signs. And then lastly, and I think the most important one of, of, of all of these is employment. Uh, payrolls and unemployment remain well above recessionary levels, and we're going to see that uh, visually in a second. But um, you know, every recession that we've had since the 40s um, has coincided with payrolls and employment going down at a pretty aggressive clip. Um, and, and right now, we're just, just not seeing those numbers um, play out. Now, of the five that we're going to look at, so we got three on the no recession side, but not all of them um, are, are, are pointing to that. So what's on the recession side? Um, you have the yield curve. So it's currently extremely inverted, um, about 100 basis points inverted. And what that means is that, you know, historically, the two-year yield is lower than the 10-year yield. Um, and that's called a positive spread. When those numbers are reversed, um, that means there's an inverted yield curve. And historically, it's been a very accurate predictor of recession, but the timing of this varies great. Usually the lag uh, between when we get an inverted yield curve and then you get a recession can be anywhere from six to 24 months. So we're still in that window um, and we've got an inverted yield curve that's been sitting there inverted for quite a while. Um, but again, the timing on that um, is, is a little less certain. And then lastly, leading economic indicators. So that index continues to trend lower uh, and is currently at a level that has coincided uh, with the last three recessions. So if we were looking at this as a scorecard, um, and we use these five as, as kind of the main uh, components of this. You have three for the no recession side and then two for the recession side. So you can see where maybe the confusion comes in from those Google headlines and why you know, there's, there's still a lot of people saying, hey, we're, we're still going to have a recession, um, but the data just doesn't quite support that uh, in full quite yet. And then lastly, when we talked about employment, just to see it visually, um, these gray bars represent recessions going back to the 40s. And it's pretty, pretty obvious. Every time these gray bars come, you see a dip in this line. And this is basically just all employees um, on a cumulative basis. So until we see this number start to roll over in any meaningful way, it's really hard uh, to have a recession uh, take hold uh, in the economy. So, so we've talked about the current state of equities. We've talked about the current state of fixed income and economics. So, Dan, what does all this mean, and and, and what are we uh, what are we seeing um, as possibilities uh, for the second half uh, of 2023? Yeah, so uh, already halfway through the year. That's that's pretty hard to believe, but um, we're going to take a look at what we're seeing uh, as a firm and what we're what changes we're going to make to your portfolio um, in the second half. So as Casey mentioned earlier, uh, the Dow Jones Industrial Average had a historic win streak. Um, a lot of news pundits will tell you that this is a blow off top or a bubble or all sorts of whatever, but history tells us something a little bit differently. So when the Dow has 11 day win streaks, if we look back through history, when we see those moments, this is bull market activity. So you can see, as Doug's pointing, 1955, 1970, um, the average return when we have these winning streaks um, six months out, which would be the end of 2023, is 11%, median return being 12.5%. Um, and that actually, of all the signals going back to 1945, that's been 100% accurate. There's never been a down period. Now, uh, 12 months out, you're seeing an average of 8.3% returns, median being 5.3. Um, that only hit 80% of the time. Um, and as Doug can show you, uh, 1987, the flash crash of 87 was the only time that 12 months out, the win streak actually ended up losing money if you played that trade. Um, but that was actually nine months after the signal. You had nine months of, of solid bull market activity um, going forward. So 
Some people might say 11 day winning streak, whatever, that's not a big deal. But we can look at the S&P 500, which is telling a little bit of a longer term story. So the S&P 500 on the next slide here is actually on a month long streak. So it is getting close to closing in on a five month winning streak. So if the S&P 500 doesn't drop more than 2% by Monday at close, we're going to be on a five month winning streak. So again, people will tell you it's frothy, blow off top, anything like that. But this is normal bull market activity. Um, and if we look at the returns on the table on the left, there's a lot of green numbers there, um, especially three months, six months, 12 months out. Um, the average return for the S&P 500 when it's put in five green months in a row is 12.5%. That's much larger than the S&P 500 historical average return um, because these periods usually come at the beginning and middle of bull markets. So throughout the rest of the year, we definitely see some upside potential in equities um, going through all the way into December. Um, so we've talked a little bit about the concentration at the top, the top 10 stocks, the S&P 500 being overvalued, having high PE ratios. Um, that's definitely the case. But again, it's just 10 stocks. If we look at the 490 stocks that aren't in the top 10, the rest of the index, the valuations don't look too scary. Um, so on this chart, on the far left, you see the top 10 stocks. They're trading at about a 30.6 price to earnings ratio, and they're weighted at a little over 30% of the index. So that's a very, very large chunk. And as you've seen the Apples, Microsoft, NVIDIAs of the world continue to rally, it's really pulled the S&P 500 up. Um, but if you look at the rest of the index, there's a lot more room to go. Um, so, I mean, if you had a basket of 10 stocks equally weighted and 30% of your stocks were not really doing much at all, but the rest of the 70% were continuing to rally, that your portfolio would go up. So we definitely see a lot of opportunities still throughout the rest of the year in the S&P 500 as we're seeing that broadening. Um, Casey talked about the equal weight, equal weight index. That's beaten the S&P 500 over the last 11 weeks. That's not an insignificant time frame. The market is broadening. Um, and that's going to continue to be kind of fuel on the fire to continue the rally going into the next, you know, three, six months of the year. Um, and then again, talking about valuations, um, not only with the rest of the S&P 500, but in small caps. So this chart right here shows the S&P valuation compared to small cap valuations. So when the line is at the very top, that means that the S&P 500 is very over, overvalued in relation to small cap stocks. So as you can see, the last time we were up along these really high elevated levels was the 2000s, the tech bubble. And then you saw a decades long run of those valuations starting to normalize. Well, we're, we're back again. Um, we're running up at 20 year highs where the small cap stocks, the specifically the S&P 600, which are more quality small, small cap stocks, are showing historically undervalued compared to the S&P 500. So that's really why we own them in the portfolio. Um, <clears throat> we bought some back in uh, in June of 2022. Um, and, you know, with the value game, it's, it's a very long term play. You you own the stocks and over the long run, it pays to buy equities at cheap valuations. Um, not saying we're going to be continuing to add, but if you know things start turning around and the economy really picks up, since small caps carry a little bit more risk, we might be adding to them. <clears throat> and then, so from the equity picture, again, for the rest of the year, there's definitely some potential for some more upside. But the thing that gets me most excited is the fixed income market. So for the first time in a long time, um, yields are are very attractive. Um, not only are <clears throat> coupons and nominal yields attractive, but we're getting positive real yields. 
So as inflation falls and these yields stay high, that's more and more money that we're compounding on top of inflation every single year. So that hasn't happened for a while. And it's, it's really excited to really start getting paid to own bonds again. Um, so this chart shows kind of bond yields since COVID um, and how they've really risen su substantially. A lot of that is, is Fed driven. So the Feds have uh, the Federal Reserve has hiked rates, um, causing yields to kind of rise all across the curve. Um, and it's it's really starting to reflect at some pretty attractive numbers. So that um, lighter blue teal line is the U.S. high yield corporates. And the darker blue line is U.S. investment grade corporates. High yield, you're seeing numbers, you know, high eights, some in some places even higher. And in investment grade, you're seeing 5%. Um, and when you have an environment where we have yields paying this much and inflation is falling, that really paints the picture for positive real yields. Um, we recently made a trade in portfolios to add some, some floating rate, which will capitalize on rising interest rates. Um, the coupon will continue to rise. The yield will continue to rise. And we also added long-term treasuries. So long-term treasuries for the first time in a very long time are, are yielding positive real yields that are attractive. Um, and historically, long-term treasuries have been great buffers for market volatility. So not only are we picking up some extra yield, some good yield, um, but we're insulating our equity portfolio a little bit. Um, to me, that's very attractive. Uh, throughout the yes, rest of the year with, with your portfolios, we're definitely going to be looking to be opportunistic to continue to add to these products, to continue getting more yield, and to continue kind of buffering the portfolio's equity downside. So second half, a summary. Equities definitely still have more room to run. Um, you're seeing a broadening in the market. Um, this is bull market, bull market action. Um, again, you have the equal aid index running, um, you have the Dow running, which is usually seen now as the little brother to the S&P 500 as the, and the NASDAQ. Indexes are making new highs um, or new 52-week highs. Um, it, it's, this is bull market activity. You don't have to be worried about you know, frothiness or going too high too fast. This is normal bull market activity. Um, fixed income. We, we're probably going to continue to barbell trades to get higher income and buy treasuries to offset market risk with positive real yields. Um, we have a lot of money in money markets right now. It's, it's very difficult to say goodbye to that five and a quarter percent free yield to buy some other bonds. But the risk adjusted returns, as Doug was talking about earlier, um, the upside is just significantly more attractive than the downside at this point. So, you know, we're, we're going to continue to look at bonds um, and we're probably going to continue to add throughout the rest of the year and be opportunistic when we see uh, good opportunities in the market. Now, all this on a backdrop of pretty uncertain economic um, environment. So, HCM's base case uh, is slow down in the second half of 2023. So a slowdown doesn't necessarily mean we're going to tip deeply into recession or the market is really going to have to take a dive. Um, a slowdown really means that the, the economy starts slowing down, kind of resets, and then starts to continue going forward. Um, as long as we have strong jobs, as long as um, equity earnings continue to be resilient, um, we could definitely see a scenario in which that slowdown gets pushed out into 2024. Um, we're not completely taking our eye off that. That's on our radar. We're watching jobs every day. We're watching all sorts of leading economic indicators and making sure that um, we're making sure that we're going to stay insulated when something does come up. Um, but if we still get the strong jobs, still get the good, resilient earnings, um, we could definitely see that slowdown pushed out into 2024. Yeah, thanks, Dan. So, you know, I, I think, you know, a lot to be optimistic about, um, you know, certainly some things to be concerned about as well. But uh, I think on the heels of last year, um, I think everybody's um, happily surprised at, at the strength sure. that we've seen. So um, some questions that have come in here. Um, so the first one, um, 
when or do we think that the election could start to affect the market? Um, and just and just to give a time frame here, we're um, we're quite a ways out, you know, over twelve months away. But um, it seems like for whatever reason, politics has has taken a a front stage, um, probably a little too much. But uh, nonetheless, I guess thoughts on that. So, I mean, when you look at history and you look at the, uh, the the cycle from the standpoint of elections, historically speaking, years three and years four, which we're in year three right now, historically is the best year for the market uh, by far, and year four has been strong. So some of the, the thought is that the first two years, um, you have more legislation that's um, maybe a little bit more from a negative perspective um, in, in the last two are going to do are going to more be driving the economy. You've got politicians who want to be reelected, so they're going to do things to help uh, help the economy out, and certainly that can be then beneficial for the market. Uh, I I always you know really always try to caution investors to with, with politics and investing, just because it, it's oftentimes the thesis I see uh, ends up playing itself in a much different way. So I'll give you an example. And uh, maybe this doesn't necessarily tie to the election, but oftentimes candidates will have different platforms and what they run on and what really happens in the execution oftentimes is vastly different. So I'll give you an example. And so back in the 90s when uh, Bill Clinton was elected, and so uh, Hillary Clinton was really uh, taking a look at healthcare and putting healthcare in the crosshairs at that point in time. And, and you would have thought that that could have resulted in really poor performance. Well, during the eight year period, healthcare was actually one of the best performing sectors uh, during that period. And, and there's been many other periods like that. So um, when Obama was in office, um, you had some concern about financials and, and regulation and Financials actually did okay. Now they were coming out off after the the financial crisis, so it was a little bit of a different time period. But we, we see so many different examples of this, where a candidate may have a platform, and in reality, there's just a lot of legislation they can't get through. Uh, so gridlock, more than anything, oftentimes is really what the market's looking for. Um, and so we try to brush the politics aspect of it aside and. Um, but certainly right now we're in the sweet, sweet part of the cycle in years three and four right now. Yeah. So, so it, it's, I, I think a good summary of that would be, we don't, we don't need to worry about it yet. Yeah. Okay. Um, uh, so another question uh, that kind of relates to the narrowness of the market. So do we have any opinions on why the rally has been so narrow and do we think it can continue like this? Dan, Dan, I'll I'll let you take this one. Yeah, I mean, coming out of the the bear market, um, I think a lot of people viewed some of these um, mega cap tech names, Apple, Microsoft, um, as absolute stalwarts. Um, They're able to, you know, essentially print money. Um, they are insanely profitable, hugely profitable. Um, Apple sitting on billions of dollars of cash. These, these guys have insane war chests. Um, it's almost like the market kind of viewed them as safe haven assets. Um, and, you know, as people started buying into these stocks, they started rallying and it almost became a, a self-fulfilling uh, prophecy. And then on top of that, you had AI. So AI came out NVIDIA being kind of the main benefactor of AI uh, semiconductors. You need those chips to run these very complicated um, deep language software programs. Um, But I think a lot of institutional investors started looking around saying, who's going to benefit the most from AI? Well, it's going to be these massive tech companies that um, already can already have the infrastructure. They can, they can turn this on whenever they want Um, And they're going to be the leaders in the space as they're always the leader in every space, every new technology space. So I think a lot of money just um, started flowing into those names initially as kind of like they were uh, almost a safe haven asset because they were so strong. And then the AI boom kind of stacked on top of it. um, And people just kept on going in and, and buying these names because it was working. 
Yeah, no, I, I think that makes sense. I mean, what I would add to that too is, you know, on the heels of kind of the cycle, the full cycle that we saw coming out of COVID, a lot of money went into those names. Yeah. Um, you know, a lot a of lot investors, to be yeah, believing that, you know, these were the only names that you had to own forever and you'd be fine. Um, 2022 showed that they were not invincible. Um, they were down quite a bit as a whole. Um, but, you know, memories are short. And as we saw things mm-hmm. start to to rebound a little bit, um, you know, it, it could have been kind of that chase again. I think another big aspect of it is that as as markets have become more you know, movable with passive flows and, and mm-hmm. index ETFs have co- become more popular. I mean, we look at the the concentration right now in the index. And as Casey mentioned, you know, if you put a dollar into the S&P or, or you buy that index, almost 30 cents of it is going to those names um, because it's market cap weighted. So naturally the money flows there and, and pulls those higher. So um, yeah, I mean, can it continue? I mean, it can, but it's it's not necessarily a healthy environment to not have a market that is broadly participating mm-hmm. uh, in the move. And luckily we've seen that start to take place. I think we'd like to see it to, to continue, certainly. Um, but you know, can a market run at 30% concentration for a long period of time? I, I don't think that that's a, a good thing. Yeah, and I think on the in, the in the tech space specifically on that, um, you know, there's there's lessons from the past. I think you one can look at and still glean and, and learn from. And Cisco is a good example of that mm-hmm. you know, ninety nine two thousand. It was the, the I think the largest stock in market cap. It had a monstrous move. And guess what? We've had some tech stocks that have had some monstrous moves. No one's arguing that AI is here and it's going to be fascinating to see what happens with AI, but there's a difference between great franchise and is it a good price for that franchise? And mm-hmm. uh, and that that could be at some point in time, be some pressure on some of these tech names. Sure. Um, so two more questions here. So one, kind of asking some more specific sector type stuff. Um, really oils and oil industrials, financials, um, you know, regional banks, things like that. While, you know, with some specific names in there, I don't, I don't want to get into those necessarily and talk about, um, you know, recommendations or opinions on what we think those will or will not do. Um, what I will say is that if the economy is strong, industrials should participate in that. Um, and we've seen that starting to take place right now. Um, I think the regional banks on a whole have started to recover slightly, but they're certainly not um, where they were before. Um, You know, so far, earnings for those uh, those banks have have been they've been okay. Um, Haven't been a disaster, but you know, just the other day, I think it was either yesterday or the day before, um, you had another bank failure. Um, So those those areas are certainly not out of the woods yet, um, but they're they're moving in the right direction, I would say. Um, and then, you know, with oil at $80, um, you know, th- those uh, those areas are, are, or the companies that participate uh, in that area of the market, you know, at $80 a barrel, they're, they're going to make money. Um, you know, we may not see the gangbuster you know, price increases that we saw um, when it was at $120 a barrel, but um, they're certainly going to generate good cash flow um, and hopefully continue to, to generate increasing dividends. Um, in that space. Uh, so last question here is we're kind of running up against time. So how high do we think the Fed will raise rates? Um, that is a that is a good question. I don't really have the answer to that. Obviously, um, a lot of people are saying that the last rate hike just happened, um, that they're going to pause um, and kind of see how things are. I think if inflation continues to trend down, there's no reason why they need to continue to raise rates. I mean, at this point, uh, I believe the Fed funds rate is above what the annualized inflation rate is. So uh, historically, they've had to take it above there uh, to make sure that it's restrictive. But um, there's there's certainly a lot of people who are in the camp that this was uh, the last rate hike uh, for the cycle. And you know, I think as fast as they went and aggressive as they did, um, you know, are we going to have a soft landing? That's yet to be seen, but uh, I think there was fears of a lot worse things happening um, with with this type of aggressive 
uh, rate campaign. So, you know, personally, I know I've been um, somewhat skeptical of the Fed and their uh, their actions and, and some of the things they've said. But you know, to their credit, so far they they seem to have um, threaded the needle for now uh, of a very difficult situation. So, um, so yeah, we'll we'll see. But uh, so I think that's all for the questions right now. So uh, Casey, you can go ahead and take us out. Well, thank you for the trust and confidence you've placed in HCM. Uh, if there's a family member or friend that we can help, please don't hesitate to reach out to provide an introduction. We would be honored. Have a great evening. Thanks.